Well, good morning, Wynn Stanley. How is everyone this morning? It's good to see you today. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, I'm Daryl Harris. I'm the interim pastor here. I've been here about a month, and I'm loving it. People are so kind, so if you're a guest, I wholeheartedly recommend this place to you. If you are a guest, we'd invite you to take a guest card from the pew in front of you and fill that out. Put it in the offering plate, especially if you're a first-time guest. Uh, so that will help us to get to know you and know how to minister to you a little bit better. In case you haven't figured it out, uh, we're getting ready for Vacation Bible School. Uh, if you're a guest, uh, the, the platform doesn't usually look quite like this, okay? Uh, the VBS team has done a wonderful job in preparation of decorating, uh, trying to get us into the mood and the atmosphere of shipwrecked, rescued by Jesus. Uh, we've had a, number, a lot of other people that have been working hard uh, preparing for their classes, uh, their crafts, and of course the most important thing, the snacks. Um, and, uh, so we're, we're, we're really excited about that uh, starting this evening. Uh, but it, sometimes, you know, having things like this up on the platform may be a little bit of a distraction for some people, at least for the first 45 seconds or so. But instead of letting it be a distraction, I think it ought to help us to focus on the God who rescues us. Uh, because God is not just a rescuer of children. He's a rescuer of all of those who need him. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 91, The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. That's why we're here to worship him this morning. Uh, most of us here this morning can say that I've been rescued by Jesus. Uh, we all need that rescue. So as Nancy plays, let's, let's focus on the God who rescues us and prepare our hearts for worship.
pray. Father, we're coming together this morning as your church. And we thank you that you are indeed the God who rescues us. Because, Lord, we need you so badly. We need you to rescue us. We need you to rescue our families, our community, our nation, and our world. So, Lord, we're, we're here this morning simply to worship you because you are a God powerful enough to do all of that. And, Lord, we thank you that all it takes for us to be rescued is simply to acknowledge that we need you, that we're sinners and can't do it on our own and that we trust in your son, Jesus Christ, who made that tremendous sacrifice on our behalf on the cross and now lives forever, having been resurrected. Father, this morning as your church, help us to feel rescued. Help us to acknowledge what you have done in our lives because that is why we worship you. That is the only reason we can worship you. Lord Father, thank you for loving us. Speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters he lifted me. Now safe am I. Let us stand together and sing. <clears throat>
children's message. some other type of candy. Um, do you ever ask your parents for candy? Maybe something like this. Do you ever ask your parents for candy, whether it's at home, and you might see their candy, and you want that sometimes? Anybody? Raise your hand. Or you're at the store, and you're in the checkout aisle, and you see something like this, you might want it. Um, do your parents ever say no? When you want candy, they ever say no? <coughs> Raise your hand if they say no sometimes. Does that make you happy? No. <laughs> now, your parents understand that if you eat too much sugar, it's not good for you. And you're not going to be healthy if you have sugar all the time. Sometimes you might not see that, and you might think, I just want that candy, but your parents understand, sometimes by experience, right, that sugar is not good for you. Too much of it isn't. Uh, you might get some cavities. Some other things might happen. If you look at, at the nutrition on this, there's just not much nutritional value. It's not going to help you grow. Now, here's another type of beans that you might get instead from your parents that they might want to give you. These are green beans. Do you like green beans? Some of you do, okay? But um, your parents are gonna try to get you to eat these because they know what's best for you. They might say no to something like this sometimes, but they will give you what is good for you and what you need. You know, sometimes we're like that when we go to God and we ask him for something that we think is very good for us or that we might want. And sometimes God doesn't seem to answer our prayers right away. Uh, sometimes he says no. And kids, it's not because he doesn't love you or because he doesn't want what's best for you. It's because he knows what is best. Maybe if you're feeling sick, and you want to get better right away, you want to get better that day or within 10 or 15 minutes, that, that might not happen. Usually it doesn't, but God knows what he's doing in our lives. And the greatest thing that we need from God, that we need to go to him for, is forgiveness of our sins and salvation in Jesus. We need to be rescued, like the theme for VBS. We need to be rescued from our sins, and only Jesus can do that. Let's pray to him. Father, thank you that you know what is good for us. And thank you that uh, many times you do say no. Because we shouldn't have um, a lot of the things that we ask for um, in the timing that we ask for them. So thank you for your goodness and, um, and your wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen.
Now, last Sunday, we looked at five conditions of answered prayer, and we looked at five different ways, uh, five different things that can either limit or strengthen our prayers, but let's be honest. Sometimes, even when we meet all five of the conditions we talked about last week, God still doesn't answer our prayers exactly like we prayed them, right? He still doesn't give us exactly what we're asking for. So what's up? Is it just false advertising? Is, is God teasing us? Is God saying, uh, ask and I'll answer, but uh, I really don't mean it? No. God's not just teasing us. God promises to answer our prayers. God always answers our prayers. He just doesn't always answer them the way we want him to. In fact, God hasn't even promised to answer the prayers any old way we want him to. But there's really about four different ways that God answers our prayers. I used to think there were only three, but then I discovered a fourth one. Uh, the, the first of those is yes. We like it when God says yes. The second one is not yet. The third one is no. And the fourth one that I've recently discovered is sometimes God answers our prayers by, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> you know, have, have, have you ever had, you know, ask, ask a prayer so ridiculous that you know that God's answer was, you've got to be kidding me? Um, I have. I don't know about you. you know, I, I like it when God says yes. That's, you know, that's what I want. But sometimes God says not yet. He says, I am going to give it to you. But not right now. And the thing is, we never know how long that wait is going to be. But we need to understand that a delay is not a denial. Uh, they're not the same thing. Let me give you an example. The church right now is praying that God will send us a great new senior pastor. His answer is yes, he will. But it's a not yet. <laughs> We know he's going to send us a great new senior pastor, but right now the answer is not yet. You've got to put up with this guy for a while. And, and, and we, we don't know how long the delay is going to be. It might be two months. It might be 12 months. It might not. I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> we don't know. But sometimes God says, no, I'm not going to give that to you. And isn't that the most difficult to handle? Why does God sometimes say yes? And sometimes say no? Well, when, when we think about that, there, there are some mysteries about the way God answers prayers and why he says no. But, but some of the reasons are very, very obvious. Let me just run through a couple, two or three of them real quick for you. These aren't on your outline. But... One of the obvious reasons God sometimes says no is because people are praying for opposite things. You know, in every athletic contest, some people are praying for this team to win, and some people are praying for this team to win, and they can't both win, okay? So God can't answer both of those prayers. Sometimes during the winter time, children pray for it to snow so they don't have to go to school. And the parents are praying for it not to snow so they can go to work. God can't answer both of those prayers yet. I think that's pretty obvious. Uh, another uh, that is fairly obvious is that if God were to say yes to some of our prayers, he would have to violate the free will of somebody else. And God says, I'm not going to do that. Uh, God doesn't force his will on anybody. When we pray, God, make that person do this, he says, I don't make you do the right thing all the time. Why would I make them? It's their free choice. Um, and God's not going to take away our free will just to answer a prayer. So there's a logical reason why people pray for things that don't happen. There, another one that is easy for us to understand, or easy for us, yeah, easy for us to understand, but difficult for us to accept is this. If every sick person that we prayed for recovered, anybody with great faith would never die. Okay. Right? And we know that that's not going to happen because in this earth, on this earth, people die. Even the people that Jesus personally and physically healed when he walked on this planet died. We are not meant to live on this planet forever. Now, we are designed to live forever. 
Aren't you glad it doesn't have to be here? Because I don't want to live on this planet forever. Because in this planet there is suffering and there is sickness and there is sadness and there's racism and there's injustice and there's war. I want to live forever in a place where there's none of that. And God says we get that opportunity. Every human being is going to die at some point. So why are we shocked when sometimes God doesn't answer our prayer for them to recover? Just doesn't make, it's not logical. But I mean, honestly, knowing that doesn't make it any easier to accept. But we can understand it. So there are some obvious reasons why God says no, but there are other times when God says no, and it just seems unexplainable to us. It just doesn't make any sense. The thing that confuses us is that if God is all loving and all powerful, and we know that he is, but if he is all loving and all powerful, then why does he sometimes deny my seemingly good requests? I mean, I'm not asking God to make me a gazillionaire so I can go to Las Vegas and blow it all. You know, it's just a good, legitimate prayer request, in my opinion. But God sometimes says, no. Why does he do that? Makes no sense. Well, when that happens, that's when it's unbearable. That's when it's heartbreaking. That's when you go, I don't understand why God said no. I just don't get it. And, you know, that's just one of those things that, that we struggle with all of the time. Why did God say no to that? My iPad died. It's coming back up. Okay? Now, we need to deal with this because this is one of those issues that we all struggle with. Why does God sometimes say no? Now, this morning I want to look at three reasons God says no, but before I get to those, you'll notice that there is a warning in your message notes, and it'll be up here on the screen. And that warning is this. Use the reasons I'm about to share with you to comfort yourself. But never, never use them with somebody else who is in pain. Because you don't know why God said no to them. Amen. Okay? I'm going to give you three reasons. But for somebody else, it may not be any of these three reasons. And it would be presumptuous for you to think that you understand why. And even if you are right, explaining it to them won't help. We sometimes think that if I just understood why something happened, uh, I, it, it, it'll make it easier. <laughs> Explanations don't. I mean, she didn't like this example this morning, but I'm going to give it again. If my wife were to, to die tomorrow night, and I knew exactly why. And I understood all of the reasons why she died. It still wouldn't lessen the pain. Understanding why doesn't make it any less powerful. When someone dies, when tragedy happens, our first question that we always ask is, why? Why? Let me tell you, that's okay. It's okay to ask God why. Even Jesus, when he was hanging on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? He understood fully what was going on, but it didn't make it any easier for him. So there are some things you're only going to understand in heaven. So never presume to know why God does something to somebody else unless he tells you. And don't use these reasons to try to comfort anybody else. Do you get that? I, I don't want you to get in trouble when you take these and say, the pastor said. No. That being said, I want to give you three reasons why God sometimes says no. The first of those is God sometimes says no because he has a bigger perspective. God says no because he has a bigger perspective. God sees the whole picture. We don't. God has a wide-angle view. We have a very narrow tunnel vision view. For one thing, God can see the future. We can't see the future. Hebrews 4.13 says, There is nothing that can be hidden from God. Everything in all creation is exposed and lies open before his eyes. 
and it is to him that we must all give an account of ourselves. You know, if you and I could see everything the way God sees it, it would solve a lot of our problems. We would never have any unexpected troubles. Now notice I didn't say we would never have any troubles. I didn't say that. We would never have any unexpected troubles. Uh, we would know exactly what was coming at all times. We would be able to prepare for it in advance without any difficulty. We'd always know exactly how to pray, but that would take away all of the aspects of faith. If you know exactly what's going to happen, uh, you really don't have to have a lot of faith. But we're human. That means we are limited. And because we're limited, we need God's bigger perspective. Sometimes we need God to say no. Fielding dealt with this with the, with the children. As parents, do you ever say no to your children? <laughs> yeah, all the time. You know, your child wants to touch a hot stove. And you say no. Your 16-year-old son comes to you and says, can I spend this summer hitchhiking across the country? And you say no. <laughs> because we have a bigger perspective. We know the consequences of those kinds of behavior. And if you have a bigger perspective <laughs> than your kids and understand that sometimes you need to tell them no. How much more should our Heavenly Father have a much bigger perspective than us? And sometimes he says no because he sees the danger ahead. See, one of our problems is we don't understand the consequences of how God is going to answer that prayer. If God were to answer our prayer the way we ask, it might be okay right now, but we have no idea what the consequences down the road is going to be. You see, every time a prayer is answered, it sets into, into uh, effect a chain of consequences. And we never know what's coming up at the end of that chain. God does. And so sometimes God has to say no here because he knows if he doesn't, it's going to lead to this. And he doesn't want us to go there. When I ask God for something, I can't foresee the implications or the consequences. I don't know what that's going to set in motion. And you can drive yourself crazy trying to just figure out, why did God say no to that? <laughs> because he knows that four steps down the road, <laughs> you need that no. We usually just have to trust his bigger perspective. Sometimes God says no to protect us from things we can't see. Proverbs 2.8 says, God, guard, God guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. You might want to circle those words, guards and protects. What does that mean? It means that God doesn't take you out of all trouble. It doesn't mean he takes you out of the frying pan, even when the, it starts to get a little hot. Sometimes God leaves us in that frying pan. He just keeps us from getting burned. In the book of Daniel, there's a story about three Hebrew men. Uh, that, that is a wonderful illustration of this. Uh, the, the king had issued an edict that everyone had to bow down and worship him, bow down and pray to him. And these three Hebrew men says, we're not going to do that. We don't bow down and pray to anybody but God. The consequences of not bowing down and praying to the king was that they would be thrown into a fiery furnace. These three Hebrew men said, we don't want to go in the fiery furnace. God, please protect us from that. He said, well, I'll protect you, but not quite the way you want. You're going to be thrown in the furnace. He said, I'm going to be right there with you. And he protected them. And when they came out of the fiery furnace, they didn't even smell like smoke. But the ropes that had bound them had been burned off. Sometimes God lets us go into the furnace to burn off those things that are tying us down so that when we come out on the other side, we're going to be free, free from guilt, free from shame, free from fear, free from that habit. The things that have been binding us will be burned off. That wouldn't happen if we didn't go through the fire. Sometimes God says, no, just to set you free. Because he has a bigger perspective. The second reason God says no is because he has a better plan. God has a better plan. He says, I want to answer your requests, but I'm going to do it in a way different than you imagined because I have a better plan. Isaiah 55 says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. 
Have you ever discovered that God's plan for you was different than your plan for yourself? <laughs> you know, God, God has a plan, but it's different. There, there's not a single person in this room this morning whose life has turned out exactly the way you planned it. <laughs> and for some of us, for most, for all of us, that's a good thing. <laughs> because God's plans are better than our plans. Uh, you might want to look at that phrase, for my ways are higher than your ways. You might want to circle that word ways. Notice it's plural. God has more of one, more than one way he can do things. It's not just yes or no with God. It's which of my thousands of options can I use to answer this prayer? Let's say, for example, and I hope this doesn't apply to anybody here, but I'm sure it does. Let's say that you're in financial difficulties. <laughs> you're in debt. And you're praying, God, help me get out of this debt. That's a legitimate prayer, okay? Now, God can answer that prayer in a number of different ways. He could just give you the miracle of a pile of money that shows up in your mailbox. Uh, well, let's be honest, that's what you're praying for, right? <laughs> you know, but he probably isn't going to use that way. He could raise your income. He could help you get a better, higher paying job. He could lower your expenses. He can make what you have last longer. He can teach you how to be a better money manager. There are 15, 20, 30 different ways God can answer that prayer, and he'll probably use a combination of several of them to answer that prayer. Some of them may be miraculous, and some just are, you know, give you some common sense. <coughs> But our problem, as I think I mentioned last Sunday, is when we pray, we don't just ask God for things. We tell him, right? We tell him when we want it. We tell him where we want it. We tell him how we want it gift wrapped and how we want it delivered. And God says, wait a minute. I have a better plan. I have a better plan. Let me use my plan. See, when we pray, and let's be honest, when we pray, we want God to answer our prayers in the easiest, quickest way possible, don't we? I, you know, I, I'm not as old as some of you, and, you know, some of you have heard a lot more prayers than I have, so maybe you've heard people pray like this. I never have. God, please answer my prayer, but please do it in the slowest, most difficult way possible. <laughs> I've never heard anybody pray that way. But God isn't interested in either speed or convenience. He's interested in the best way to answer your prayer. Because, and you've heard me say this before, you're going to hear me say it a lot more. God is not interested in your comfort. He's interested in your character. God doesn't want you just to relax easily. He wants to grow you. His job is not to meet all of your desires and wishes and whims. You'd be a spoiled brat if God gave you everything you asked for. So God says, when I say no, sometimes it's because I have a better plan. There's an interesting verse over in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. This is the chapter we refer to as the, as the honor roll of faith. You know, God's honor roll of, of all of the great heroes of the faith. And there's this verse after that that says these people were commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. None of them received what had been promised. Because God had what? He had a better plan. He had planned something better. Now, I want you to write this down because it's an important lesson of life. It's a principle of life. God has all of eternity to fulfill his promises. God has all of eternity to fulfill his promises. There are somewhere between six and 7,000 promises in the Bible. But God is not limited to your 80 or 90 or 110 years on this planet to answer those promises, to fulfill those promises, or to answer your prayers. Some of those promises, he's got all of eternity to answer those, and to fulfill those. And let's be real honest. Some of our prayers can only be answered on the other side. Some of us, the answer to our prayer is heaven. I can honestly say that there are times when I am 100% happy that God didn't say no to, I mean, didn't say yes to my prayers. He said no. 
Now, now I wasn't real thrilled with it at the time. <laughs> but looking back, I can say I'm really glad God said no. And if you've ever been to a high school class reunion, <laughs> you are glad that God said no to some of your prayers. <laughs> You see that girlfriend or boyfriend, <laughs> and you see what they've grown up to be, you're glad God didn't let you marry them, right? Sometimes God has a better plan. The third reason he says no is he has a greater purpose. Proverbs 16, 4 says, the Lord has made everything for his own purpose. God has a purpose behind everything that happens, and he's not obligated to explain that purpose to you. <laughs> It simply isn't. God doesn't have to ask our approval. He doesn't have to ask, is it okay with you if I do this differently? See, God has his plans. God has his purposes. And you are a part of his purpose, not vice versa. Again, God wants to focus on our character while we want to focus on our comfort. God wants to focus on eternal treasures. Well, we simply want to focus on temporary pleasures. God knows that those pleasures aren't going to last. So he says, focus on what's going to last. And what is God's purpose in our problems? Well, he has a lot of them, but one of them is found in 1 Peter 1.7. Peter writes, the purpose of these troubles is to test your faith. As fire tests how genuine gold is, your faith is more precious than gold. God wants to test our faith. So sometimes God delays an answer, and he says, will you still trust me? And sometimes God says no to one of our requests, and then says, will you still trust me? You know, sometimes when a child asks, why? Your loving response to them is, because I said so. <laughs> right? You ever answer your children or grandchildren with that answer? Now, what you're really saying, I mean, you've shortened this answer way down. But what you're really saying is, you need to trust me. I'm wiser than you are. I'm more experienced than you are. I know more than you. I love you, and I want what is best for you. So you need to trust me because I said so. If we as imperfect human parents do that, certainly we should be able to trust a perfect heavenly father who says that. Now I have no doubt that some of you here this morning are discouraged. You may be discouraged over a prayer that you prayed over and over and over, and it just hasn't happened yet. God, I really want to get that good job. I want, really want to get that promotion. God, I really want to get rid of this physical pain. God, I want my marriage to be better. Whatever you can fill in the blank. And it just hasn't happened. God, please pour out your spirit on this church and grant us revival. Bring us revival. It hasn't happened. And you get discouraged. God is saying, will you trust me? Will you trust me? Will you trust my timing? Will you trust my love? Will you trust my purpose, my perspective? See, the antidote to discouragement is to look past the problem to try to discover God's purpose for that. Uh, over in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul writes these words, Therefore we do not lose heart, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Let me stop right there. Those light and momentary troubles. <laughs> What's he talking about? Well, he, he tells us over in the 11th chapter, this isn't on the screen or on your notes, but just trust me on this. He, he gets over into the 11th chapter and he begins to describe his light and momentary troubles. <laughs> he's been beaten. He's been scourged. He's been thrown into prison. And appropriately enough, he's been shipwrecked three times. <laughs> And he refers to those as light and momentary troubles. <laughs> you know, you think you've got problems. Maybe ours are more light <laughs> and momentary. You say, but I don't like the problems I have in my life. 
Well, you wouldn't like anybody else's either. You wouldn't want to trade your problems for somebody else's because God has custom made your problems just for you. And he's also custom made the solution just for you. If you've got somebody else's problems, the solutions God has for you wouldn't work. But the verse goes on. He says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, referring to those light and momentary problems. What is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. That's the purpose. Sometimes God allows you to go through pain for the benefit of somebody else. God says, I know this is difficult, but there are some things that you need to learn through this pain, not only for yourself, but so you can help somebody else who's going through the same kind of thing. Sometimes God says, I love you, but I'm not going to take away the pain because there are some things for you to learn, some things for you to help others. He did it with his own son. Jesus from the cross, right? God, God, why have you abandoned me? And God let his own son go through that horrible, torturous death because God had a bigger, bigger purpose in mind, your salvation in mine. God let his own son go through that because of his greater purpose, our salvation. Now, if you want to have a little more peace in your life, want to be a little bit happier, you've got to come to grips with two fundamental truths. The first of those is there are some things I will never understand. There are some things that I'm just never going to understand until I get to heaven. <laughs> Once again, God doesn't owe us an explanation. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The Lord our God has secrets known to no one. And he just doesn't tell us. The other thing that will give me peace is when I realize and understand that some things are never going to change no matter how much I pray about them. There are some things that will never change no matter how much I pray about them. Some problems in your life are never going to change until you get to heaven. The things that happened to you in your past are never going to change no matter how much you pray about them. No matter how much you pray, you are not going to get any younger. <laughs> if this arm got cut off, I could pray and pray and pray, and it's not going to grow back. There are some problems in this world that are permanent because we live in a broken world. And God says this world is broken, but you're only here for a short time. He says, I want you to learn how to manage that. I want you to learn to trust me. I want you to learn to grow up. So what do you do when God says no? Do you just stop praying? That's right, no. Because you never know if it's a not yet or a no. So you just keep on praying. You live day by day saying, God, I'm going to pray for this. But if you choose not to give it to me, I'm still going to trust you. And I'm still going to love you because you have a greater purpose. See, one of the marks of maturity is understanding that no is a legitimate answer to many questions. And your ability to accept no from God is an indicator of your spiritual maturity. So what do you do when God says no? Two things. First, you trust that everything God does is motivated by love. Everything God does is motivated by love. Psalm 25, 10 says, all the ways of the Lord are loving. God always acts in love toward you as his child, even when you have to go through painful things. As parents, as grandparents, we often have to allow our children to go through painful things, don't we? You know, our one-year-old granddaughter right now is learning how to walk. Part of learning how to walk is stumbling and falling. Sometimes that doesn't feel very good. Other times, you know, she just falls down, you know, on her, on her bottom and she's got that nice padding <laughs> there called a diaper. But it's painful. But parents and grandparents have to let their children go through that or they've never learned how to walk. 
We sometimes have to take our children to the doctor to get a shot or a painful operation because we love them and we want them to grow up healthy and strong. God always acts in love. You need to remember that and trust that even when he says no because anytime God says no, the devil is going to start shooting darts of doubt at you. He's going to be whispering in your ear, God doesn't love you. If God loved you, he'd give you that. He doesn't care about you. Otherwise, he'd give you anything you wanted. He doesn't love you. Satan is a liar. If you haven't understood that before, you need to understand that now. Satan is a liar and he will always lie to you because the truth is God loves you too much to give you everything you ask for. No loving parent does that. God knows just what is right for you. So you need to trust that God does everything out of love. Even when he says, no, Romans 8, 28 says, in everything God works for the good of those who love him. The second thing you need to do is expect God to give you the grace to handle the no. To give you the grace to handle the no. What is grace? Well, in this particular context, grace is the power to handle the pain. When God says no. It's the power to do the right thing even when I don't feel like it. Did you know that even the Apostle Paul didn't have all of his prayers answered the way he wanted them to? We know that Paul had some kind of a serious problem. It may have been a health issue. We really don't know what it was, but he called it his thorn in the flesh. And he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, three times I prayed to the Lord about this and asked him to take it away. But his answer was, my grace is all you need. For my power is greatest when you are weak. So Paul says, I gladly boast about my weaknesses so that Christ's power can flow through me. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When God says no, we have to trust that he has a bigger perspective, a better plan, a greater purpose. So here's the question. What have you been praying for and it just hasn't happened? Will you trust God and live for him in spite of it? Will you trust him that the final chapter hasn't been written yet? And you can't see the end of your life. Psalm 9 verse 10 says, those who know the Lord will trust the Lord. That means if you don't trust God when he says no, you don't know him very well. The more you know God, the more you're going to trust him. So maybe today what you need is to get to know God. For some of you, that means that you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Savior. There's no way you can understand why God says no if you don't have a personal relationship with you, with him. Maybe you've known about him, but today you truly need to get to know him. Maybe you are a believer, but... Most of your knowledge about God is here and not here. Maybe you simply need to get to know God better so you can trust him. Let's bow our heads. Father God, this issue troubles all of us, and we don't understand why you say yes to some of our prayers and no to others. And I'm sure, Father, that there are many in this service who are struggling with a no. Give them the grace to trust you. Father, we know we struggle with doubts, but we do believe that you love us. We know that you see and you care about our situations. And we believe you know what's best for us. So please, help us to trust you when our prayers seem to be unanswered. Or to trust you when the answer is a no. Help us to see your bigger perspective and your greater purpose in our lives. And when we don't see it, help us to trust you anyway. We ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. I don't know what God's been speaking to you about this morning. Maybe you do need to accept him in your life and you may want to come and pray with me. Maybe you simply need to get to know him better. And say, God, I know you as my Savior, but I've really not been trusting in you as my Lord. And I want to trust you more. Maybe you're looking for a church home. 
is to be a wonderful place where you can serve and minister and be ministered to. Whatever it is, would you stand and respond as we sing? <laughs> teaching them that Jesus rescues from our sin, uh, providing snacks and playing games and all of the activities. Um, we acknowledge that uh, without these individuals, none of that would be possible. So, Lord, would you give them your presence this week as they minister to children, be with our children themselves as they come to hear the gospel. We pray that you would save these children, that they would trust in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 